All right, cool. What up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Business of DJing. It's your host, Jamie Selects. Thank you for tuning in again. Today, I have an awesome guest coming at you from the Bay Area. I want you to give it up uh, to my boy, Bay Wave. Welcome. Yo, yo. Thank you so much, man, for having me. I appreciate it. Not a problem, man. I've been watching you on socials for a while, and so excited to get you on and kind of talk about um, what you got going on in your DJ business. But mm -hmm. before we kick it off, we could just give a quick little intro about yourself, maybe where you're from um and kind of how you came to find djing in your life and then we can go from there yeah for sure um so i was born and raised in the bay area from oakland um i pretty much stayed in the bay area my whole life because when i went to college i went to uc berkeley and so i was always nearby in the bay area and um, i would say that's really where i got my start and uh, there in college um i kind of started djing as like a side hobby just picked up a controller one day and um, since high school, like my high school was, um, had a lot of music and like DJ influences. Like I had some big DJs that went to my high school and we would always have performances from like Too Short and like E40 and like guys like that. So I was always around the culture, like hip hop culture. Um, and so that's kind of what got me into getting my first controller. But then in college, um, I ended up doing a party just super randomly, like super unexpected and then after that night, like a bunch of other organizations that were present that night, like started reaching out for my contact information. And it literally just goes from there. Um, really, when when I started in college, I would say is where my, my journey began. But I'd never had anyone in my family that was a DJ before or um, didn't know anyone that was a DJ. So it's all kind of just me falling into the world and just falling in love with me in the art form. And um and so I just quick, quick about me, I, you know, before I used to go by DJ Gibran, which was my real name. And then after the pandemic, I decided to rebrand to Bay Wave. And that's kind of really where I feel like a lot of it really took off for me in the Bay Area. And so, um, yeah, I can kind of dive a little deeper as we go on to the questions about that, that process and what that journey was like. Cool, man. Sounds good. Um, so just as you're kicking off here, I always like to try to touch on the transition from kind of bedroom DJ, as we call it, to like just yeah. kind of professional. And so as you were just getting started, especially with not having, sounds like ne necessarily anybody in your direct uh, network as like a, a teacher, how did you go to start about practicing? How did you approach kind of going from like just playing around to like, you know, doing it more systematically and getting to a place where you felt comfortable uh, playing gigs live? Yeah, for sure. Um, Honestly, it was all, most of it self-taught, just, you know, going on YouTube um, you know, trying to find as many videos as I could on the things that I was trying to accomplish. And it wasn't really until um, I signed up for my first DJ battle. Um, for those from the Bay Area, there's a battle called No Requests. And so I signed up for the first one. And I was completely I didn't know anything about turntablism. Like I had never even touched turntables before, but I somehow decided to sign up still. Um, and that was like a very humbling experience for me because I still I did the work required to kind of get prepared for that. Like I you know, was, was like self-teaching myself. I had, I did have a friend in college. His name was Olea, who now he works very closely with Selection. Um, he had a, a turntable um, and a mixer that he would kind of come over sometimes that we'd mess around with, but he kind of gave me some pointers here and there. So I feel like that was my earliest introduction to that. But um, he also wasn't super technically skilled, so we kind of just were, were messing around half the time. But a lot of it, yeah, was self-taught. And then it wasn't until I got into that point of getting into that battle that I realized that, like, this is something that I really enjoyed doing, but I knew that I had to get better at it because being against competitors like, you know, Sean Looney and DJ Mike Cool, who had been in the industry for, for some time now and had the experience, like, it just, I, I realized that I wasn't as prepared as I wanted to be. So that just really motivated me to continue working, continue grinding. And so for the next two, three years, I ended up just learning as much as I could online and then um, putting my videos online so that people can get, you know, I can get feedback from them. And the response was always really great, um, which actually is funny because now my content is not really oriented around my, around my, my, um, uh, like my performance. Like I don't really put out routine videos anymore. Um, which I kind of do want to go back to because that was when I was first was coming up I originated doing a lot of routine videos but um, but yeah so I would say it really um, I guess my first big break that really allowed me to to you know have success in the industry was when I went to, to Pappy's which I know we're gonna talk about in a bit which that was really the first opportunity that I received to um, 
not be just a DJ, but also be a booking manager and just uh, open like many more doors for me. So I don't know if you want to save that yes. for later. You want to? No, we can get into it. Um, mm. So yeah, how did you go about like getting the residency to begin with? Had you done other gigs and have you had you like gone to that venue just to, mm. to pull up there as like a attendee or talk about the process of like locking in the residency? Yeah, so <clears throat> it was actually quite, quite crazy. So there in Berkeley, there's two local nightclubs um, slash bars. There's Kips and then there's Pappy's. So originally I had gone to Kips and I was a resident there. Um, <clears throat> it was like Tuesday nights. I was getting, you know, paid um, very minimally. But I had, a, I had a large crowd that I was able to bring from, from Berkeley, from the students that I knew. So I ended up really popularizing their Tuesday nights. And um, after that happened, Pappy's, which was across the street, was actually shut down at the time. Right. And so um, one of my friends, Jose, that was a resident with me at Kips, he went over to Pappy's and was like, hey, like, I see you guys are opening back up. Like, do you guys, you know, want some DJs? And so they ended up giving us a night, me and my friend, Jose. And um, from there, uh, the the owners just really loved us because we, we were able to bring a good crowd. And they're like, you know what, we're actually looking for resident DJs now that we're opening back up. Like, would you guys be interested in taking taking on some nights and so we were like yeah like we'd love to do that so we went back to kips and told the owner like hey we're gonna start djing over here on you know on the days that you don't hire us and he's like nope you can't do that he's like you have to choose whether you want to be here with us or, or with the competition mm -hmm. which from a business perspective made sense but from a dj perspective you're kind of like why can't i do both you know like yeah the more the more the merrier and so um you know, we ended up we ended up leaving to Pappy's because Pappy's was offering us Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and some Sundays for oh, yeah. like for like huge pay compared to what what Kips was giving us just on on Tuesday, and then actually ended up leading to some like falling out with the owner. That was like my very first experience of like a falling out with like some kind of ownership, but then because of that, I ended up really growing with the ownership over at uh, at Pappy's which uh, ends up being the same ownership as Cornerstone, which is another venue in Berkeley that's really popular. And so since through that relationship, I've been able to really keep um, like a really good network in Berkeley. And like anytime I want to do an event in Berkeley, like I have spaces that I can do that in. Um, but yeah, so pretty much at Pappy's when we transitioned over to be the residents there, the owners didn't really know much about nightlife. So it was kind of just on us to really develop the nights. And at first me and my friend Jose were taking each night. We were just pocketing the money. We we're just like, you know, let's, let's just, you know, we're college students. Let's just make as much money as we can from this residency. But then eventually got really repetitive and boring, like just DJing the same, same weekends, like same thing. Yeah. And then I was like, you know, I was really starting to get really ingrained into the culture. And I wanted to learn about DJs and other DJs in the Bay area. Cause I, at this point I had just done it just to kind of do it. Like I never was really interested in the industry itself. Um, it wasn't until I hopped on Instagram and really started doing a deep dive into the, the art of DJing and the, the culture of DJing and tapping in with other DJs around the Bay that I just like absolutely fell in love. And from there um, it just kept skyrocketing. Like I ended up connecting with um, DJ Nate Rios from San Jose at the time he had a residency at Rosie's. And he's like, hey, man, like, how about you bring me out to Pappy's and I'll bring you out to Rosie's and we can swap gigs. And to me, like, I had never even thought about that, like so the idea of swapping gigs. And that opened so many doors for me as well, because then I started swapping gigs with other DJs who were in other venues. And that's really what allowed me to start getting out. So I was no longer just stuck in Berkeley. I was now able to travel to other venues because I had this venue I could trade gigs with. So I feel like I kind of got lucky pretty early because a lot of DJs don't, you know, end up having that responsibility so early on and for me it really helped me like build my current network that I have now and you know build the relationships that I have now because for me I see it when I when I tell everyone I meet in the industry is like I don't want this to be just transactional like I actually want to build a solid friendships with you and like because I'm in this industry for the long run and so I don't want to just come to you when I need something from you like I actually want to you know catch up and like you know really talk things out and so I'm always trying my best to always just keep fulfilling my relationships with everyone because that's really what it comes down to a lot of the greatest opportunities I've received and that other people have received that I know are just through who you know you know yeah for sure yeah yeah and it always makes sense to think about things from the long term yeah so if, you're, if you were to um, if there's any DJs out there who are trying to like lock in their first residency if you were to try to summarize kind of your key learnings not only yeah. uh have a, have a residency but like 
go through the process of being someone who books and like maintaining a good relationship and kind mm-hmm. of building building an event building something at a bar if you yeah. were to try to summarize that into like a few sentences for djs trying to pick up their first one what would you say i would say my my biggest thing is just relationships is like networking so try and scope out what are some of the venues that you'd like to have a residency at um you know like identify like you know the kind of venue that you ideally would like would feel comfortable working in consistently um and then just go and try to make friends with the security guards with the bartenders with the owners um you know as many people as you can because those are at the end of the day the people that are going to end up recommending you and once you start working them building those working you know relationships and friendships so i would say no matter what your goal is no matter if you already have a residency and you're not building those relationships or if you don't have one and you want to start building those i think that's super super key no matter where you are is just really making sure you're you're super tight with everyone that you're working with and um start to build those relationships if you don't have them already because you never know where they can lead you you know even if you end up putting all this work into one venue but it it doesn't end up working out there one of those employees might end up leaving to another place and then they might recommend you there. So you really never 100%. know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Making friends with the staff is always a good idea. Cause you never, yeah. they're always like, if they don't like working with you, then they're going to talk about you in a bad yeah. way. And you never want that. So you always want to be yeah. the person that they want to, that they're excited to as DJing for that night. Yeah. And, and honestly, it's such a big thing too. Like I've, as of most recently too, been hearing just, unfortunately like some some djs haven't been cutting it like at some venues and like like people tell me like yo like this dj like the staff was just not really happy with them and like sometimes it's hard as a dj you know to kind of um be put in that position where like you're like i know some djs like again treat treat their residency is very transactional they just show up they dj and then they leave but then a, a guest dj comes in is like super respectful to the to the staff and everyone like they're going to look at them very differently you know and they that's when like people end up swooping on your position because you're not you're not right <laughs> you know you're not like maximizing it yeah have you ever had to like navigate a conversation where someone that you brought in like either didn't cut it or was like disrespectful or like maybe got too drunk like how mm-hmm. do you manage those kind of conversations yeah um as of recent i haven't just because i haven't had again like a, a position to to book, which actually, um, it's some, there's something coming very soon, which I'm excited about, which I, I can talk to. Um, but um, back when I was at Pappy's and even when I was at Cornerstone for a bit, Cornerstone, we were doing some club nights. There was a few DJs that, you know, for, for multiple reasons, I had to talk to them, whether they, you know, their, their night got pretty crazy, like maybe one of the groups of people that they brought or like um, they were just, you know, saying some things that weren't okay on the microphone or like, um, maybe even just not understanding like sound levels correctly. Like, there's been times where I've booked DJs who like completely were blasting and like redlining the speakers and you could clearly hear it, you know, like things like that. So there's always difficult conversations to have, especially when they're your friends, you got to be like, Hey man, like, you know, like, here's what I was told. And like, cause, cause sometimes I, sometimes I wasn't even there. So this is something that I would hear from other people. I think that made it easier sometimes when I'd be like, Hey, it's not coming from me. It's coming from, yeah. from the staff, you know, but, um, especially in days where I was there, like it's, it's, it's hard to have those conversations, but I think it really comes down to how the person receives it. You know, if the people, the person's open to constructive criticism or like even just feedback, I think it's always an easier conversation compared to when folks are like easily defensive. Um, I think it all depends. Like I always, I'm always a type where if I notice something and I know that I can help someone and I help them, but I don't want to immediately intrude. You know, I don't want to just come off right at the bat and be like, Hey, you should fix this. Like I'm always, trying to like lead into it like hey like would you be open to some feedback you know like um again because i feel like it's a it's a community thing you know we got to help each other out right for sure mm-hmm. so you said uh touched on cornerstone why don't we talk about that next yeah. so uh i think that's your second residency right how did you go from pappies to then getting the second one yeah so like i mentioned the pappies is the same ownership as as cornerstone so once those owners kind of let pappies um, die out due to the pandemic, they switched their full attention on Cornerstone. And then that's when they're like, hey, how about you come down here and we build up another club, like club scenario down here. And this is when things were just reopening from the pandemic. And so we were able to kind of get a really good crowd of people who were wanting to start to come out from the pandemic and have fun. But there wasn't a lot of spaces in the Bay Area that allowed for there to be, you know, events happening. 
So we kind of took advantage of that and like we're one of the first places to kind of uh, reopen um, in the midst of the pandemic and like we try to do it as safely as possible and all that and um, it was it was honestly like for me help get a lot of attention on myself because again we were like the only place open and like in the east bay that was like publicly like doing something and so a lot of djs were starting to contact me like hey like i'd love to come through like and so a bunch of djs kept coming to visit some djs that i had never met before because you know when you're actively djing and you're always booked you're like you know you can never go out on a saturday yeah. night to <laughs> dj <laughs> homie. Yeah. yeah but at this point almost no dj was booked because no venue was open so cornerstone was just the only thing that was available so i'd have tons of djs that are usually booked would come check out cornerstone and then from there I started building more relationships so that was super dope because i got to meet a lot of guys that i've always wanted to meet but had only connected with virtually right right um and so from there we ended up building that up for some, quite some time and so eventually you know once things were kind of full blast like open again then the owners realized like it was just too much to have also a club night because the cornerstone space isn't built as a club it's more like a bar like i don't know if you've been to cornerstone but half of the venue is actual concert venue and then the other half is like a bar or restaurant and so we were doing the club night in that bar or restaurant area gotcha. but now that now they have concerts like every day so it's pretty hectic to be having a concert plus a nightclub happening at the same time like it's just it says it's just a staffing nightmare so they now they're just keeping it to just the concerts. And then the other side is just like a bar kind of chill area. Um, Got it. Got it. And so I still kind of support here and there where they have like corporate events. Like they have a lot of corporate, like especially folks from like UC Berkeley or like nearby companies that host their parties there. So they'll ask me for like a recommendation here and there for a DJ and I'll like shoot some homie over that has experience in that realm. But um, it's not an active like thing anymore like it was back then. But that, again, that allowed me to meet a lot of great people and keep expanding my my network, you know. Got it. Did, when you were building it, did you have any particular type of uh, format? Or how do you think about building a like type of night for the particular space? Mm -hmm. In regards to like either like a music format or a crowd that you're trying to track, things like that. Yeah, so um, I know the owners specifically like um, – had like a vibe they were kind of going for so I kind of like try to please to that but also I would say just I was trying to find the guys who are the most open format because the thing about Pappy's and Cornerstone is that being in Berkeley you get a lot of people from everywhere depending on the night so you get either some college students or sometimes there'll be no college students at all but like random people from nearby cities and so I wanted to make sure there was always a DJ who could read the crowd well and played what was needed at that time um but I would say the big like overall arc, like the overarching theme was like kind of like sorority vibes, because obviously you're in a college town. So like you're going to expect a lot of like, you know, like a lot of the throwback pop, you know, stuff like a lot of like Queen, you know, like stuff like that, like the, um, <laughs> the Killers, Mr. Brightside, like, yeah. like a DJ that understands that realm of music, but could also dig into the hip hop pretty easily. And then obviously with the Latin wave coming up. Like can also throw in a few Latin tracks here and there because, you know, we have a lot of foreign exchange students from like Spain and like Brazil and Argentina. So like it was always key to have that kind of music in your back pocket. Right, so right. that's honestly what really allowed me to do a lot of great research on the industry in the Bay because I started meeting a bunch of dope open format DJs. Um, and then if we had like specialized events, then I would look a little more like like that's how I met like one of my one of my current mentors right now. DJ Frisco Eddie um he's someone who's like to me I look, grew up looking like I looked up to him as like a legend in the bay and never thought I could have access to him but then for Cinco de Mayo we like we needed like a really dope Latin DJ and I was like let me reach out to him and at the time again things were just picking up like he didn't really um him and any other Latin DJs didn't have booking so for him to take this and like you know like, well, that kind of really um catapulted our relationship because now like we're still like really great friends up until now so Again, I feel it all just comes back down to that, you know. Relationships. Yeah. Sure. Nice. Well, um, the next topic we had kind of talking about chatting before is uh, health. And so I just wanted to touch on mm -hmm. that and kind of allow you to explain what took place and how you, how you approach. Because sometimes DJing the lifestyle is not always in line with the best health lifestyle. Yeah. I know I struggle with that. Um, and so just curious how you manage trying to optimize for both yeah yeah man um you know so pretty much i guess what happened and what i'm doing now is 
you know, just again, like you said, being in nightlife, you're always just constantly like, um, I mean, me, I guess, because I was not used to the lifestyle. I kind of jumped into it without preparation of just like traveling and like being up so late on the weekends. And like, I wasn't meal prepping or anything. So I was just like, I would get out of the nightclub at like 2 or 3 a.m. Then I would go eat like fast food and then would just go to sleep super late, wake up super late. Like just my just my sleep schedule was super off. Like my 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 dieting was super off. Like just always eating super unhealthy, like hot dogs straight off the cart, off the vendors, like outside the clubs or like Jack in the Box or Denny's super late. And it was a really consistent thing where like I was just always eating junk, you know, because of that. And um, and so that paired with like not doing any exercise, like it just like ended up piling up on top of each other. And so I ended up develop, uh, developing uh, pancreatitis, which was essentially like my family already has a history of like of like diabetes and stuff like that. So like my pancreas is already more susceptible for like any kind of condition. So essentially, I was just taking in so much sugar and so much fat into my body that my pancreas like shut down and um, I ended up going to the hospital for the first time. Um, like for a pretty severe thing and then um, when my pancreatitis means that your pancreas gets inflamed so pretty much just like it like it like blew up and then as it was as it was released I was it was getting better it released a bunch of like bacteria like liquid into my into my like whole internal system Mm -hmm. and I developed like micro cysts essentially that were all like spread throughout my stomach and they were just super painful because like I couldn't I couldn't even like I couldn't lay down. I couldn't even sit down. Like it was just the most uncomfortable experience ever. And so I ended up going to the hospital. I was there for like two or three weeks while they were trying to extract those from, from inside of me. And then there was one cyst that was left that day. Like I, they let, they let me leave the hospital. I was back home already. And I was with Mike cool DJ, Mike cool. And his girlfriend, we had one to go see a friend. Um, His father had passed away. And so we were coming back from the funeral And we got rear-ended by a police officer on the freeway. Like, he was off-duty, but he just, like, straight rammed into the back of our car. And, like, we swerved, like, four lanes into the into the furthest lane. Mm -hmm. And it was a pretty hard impact. Like, he was coming at us pretty hard. And so that ended up – the last remaining cyst that I had ended up bursting and released more bacteria into my stomach. And then that's, like, the second time around, which all happened within a matter of, like, a month of each other. So I ended up back in the hospital – again, like pretty much the bacteria was consuming me from the inside. So I had to take a bunch of antibiotics, just all this stuff. And so I ended up losing like a bunch of weight. And like now, um, you know, now that I've been kind of been doing better, like I still have a small cyst on my left side that I'm kind of just like, got to keep an eye out and just kind of keep eating healthier and stuff. But um, it's definitely been a difficult journey, you know, just kind of realizing how my, my unhealthy lifestyle kind of led to all of that. So now I've been trying to just be better about what I'm, what I'm taking in and what I'm, um, you know, what kind how much exercise I'm getting on a daily basis. Cause before I would do no exercise. So now every morning I've been trying to challenge myself to go out for a walk at least, um, you know, I've been, um, trying to just eat healthier at home. I'm trying not to eat out at all. So like, I might, maybe I'm like on a weekend or something, but like, if it's during the week, I'm trying to just buy groceries and just buy the healthiest options possible. And so I'm really just trying to adapt to different lifestyle changes, you know, because I think I'm, like I said, I want to do this for the rest of my life. And um, I don't want to like get my journey, get cut short because I'm not taking care of myself, you know? Right. Yeah. I feel you. Health is wealth, as they say. Yeah. Focus on it if you want to uh, do this lifestyle for the long term. Yeah, exactly. So I want to circle back to, I don't know if we actually touched on the rebrand to Bay Wave. Mm-hmm. I think that happened during the pandemic. So can you just talk about how you went from like, I think DJ Gibran to Bay Wave and what, what was like the kind of strategy behind that and what was the implementation like? Yeah. So, um, you know, so I always went by DJ Gibran and I, I, I've always been a fan of like clean handles, like just like no underscores, no, like, no, um, you know, none of that. But so I was always trying to come up with the cleanest handle. And so my name Gibran is pretty popular like in you know it's a popular name common name so i ended up adding a w um in the middle so it was like jabron and that allowed me to unlock like pretty much all the handles that i wanted so i had the twitter handle the instagram handle um you know tiktok handle and i always just thought you know it's my name like i'm gonna just roll with my name like do whatever but then at the time it's like when like marshmallow was really blowing up mm-hmm 
I was like, it's crazy how like Marshmallow used to go by dot com and like you know he was pretty he big he he had some bookings he did festivals and everything but it wasn't until he rebranded to Marshmallow that he just like completely took off you know and I just was looking at other people in the space who like didn't go by their real name and like had like aliases and stuff and before I always thought that was kind of I thought that was kind of corny I'm like you know you should just use your real name like why can't I just be DJ Jabron you know Huerta but then I was just start thinking about it and um. I was like, I kind of want something that when people see my name, they're reminded of the Bay Area and like they, they immediately think music. I'm like, a lot of people are actually having trouble pronouncing my name. So a lot of people who were meeting me online who had just followed me, right. they didn't know my name was pronounced Gibran. So they'd see me on the street and they'd be like, oh, it's, you know, it's Gibran or it's like Guy Bron. <laughs> and I'm like, no, like, like it's no, not. <laughs> yeah. And so like I was getting a lot of people mispronouncing my name and it kind of frustrated me in a way. So I think that's probably the biggest reason why I ended up switching it because it was just frustrating me that nobody could pronounce my name. Right. And I was like, let me let me come up with something that people can pronounce. And so I was just brainstorming, honestly, like I was like, what can I, again, I know I want to pay homage to the Bay area and something that was related to music. So it, one day it just happened. I was just thinking about the Bay area. So, you know, Bay, that's where the Bay comes from. And then wave because of wave files, you know, like MP3 is in wave files. And right, right. I just put it together and I'm like, yo, this is fire. Like this actually like really works. And so I went on Instagram, the handle was the, the available, I bought the domain like right after baywave.com and then um, started locking in everything else that I could on social media. And, and then it just grew. It just ended up growing. So I ended up announcing the rebrand. Um, it was funny because originally I had launched it as a company that I wanted to start. Like I had this idea for like, I wanted to have my own DJ agency. And originally my DJ agency was called Baywave. So some of my close friends already knew about the name Baywave, but they, they knew of it as a company. So when I switched it to my DJ name, they were like, like, why are you calling yourself a company name? Like, it doesn't really sound a lot. A lot of people didn't believe in the name. Like literally only one person that I told about the rebrand was like, I was like, that's not going to work. Like that's like, no one's going to call you Bay wave. Like, you know, it's, and then it's fast forward to now, like there's people that don't even know my real name and now they just call me Bay wave. So it's kind of crazy how that evolved from like people like really not believing in it to now, like, it ended up taking on a journey on its own, you know? So yeah, sometimes um, you just got to trust your gut, you know, if yeah. something, something feels right, then you just got to go with it. Yeah, exactly. That's dope. So in terms of like the logistics, you said you bought a website, did the like social handles. Um, do you have a website now? What, what do you, what do you put on there? Like, what would you say? Yeah. Is your, like, do you have a online strategy? So right now I'm, I'm currently building, I'm rebuilding all that as I'm coming back to the scene. So I used to do everything myself before, cause you know, I have the skill sets and the knowledge to kind of build my own, like, you know, digital world with, you know, things that I've accumulated in college, but I realized that I'm not the most disciplined and I'm also not the most organized. So um, I was just listening to a lot of podcasts and like just people like I'm building like one person businesses and stuff like that. And they're saying like, just cause you can do everything by yourself doesn't mean you have to do everything by yourself. And I was getting a lot of people that are reaching out to me saying that they wanted to help me out. Like wanted to, you know, you know, join me in my journey. And so I actually recently ended up bringing up three, um, three individuals to join, like when I'm calling just like team Bay wave. And so one of them is going to be like my project manager. So she's helping me to kind of like make sure all my projects are in order. Um, the other person is helping me with audience and like fan like coordination. So helping me build out like my email listserv, my text listserv, um, making sure that we're getting like good guest list numbers for my events, things like that. And then another person is helping me with like more uh, securing like brand deals and like partnerships and like helping me a little out with like the fashion realm and like making sure like we're getting like sponsorships and things like that. So it's pretty cool because these are things that I've been wanting to do, but like, I just, I can't do so much all at once. So I rather like have people that are generally interested in these things and right. support me in those ways. So pretty much right now, uh, everything is kind of starting again. So I do have a website right now. It's just linked to my link tree, which like has a few things on there, like my upcoming shows and um, some things like that. But I think within the next month is going to be fully fleshed out as something completely different. Like I'm going to be launching my gum road um, site, which, uh, pretty much what I want to do on there is start um, providing tools and resources for DJs and just multiple spaces, like um, anywhere from like, 
you know, support with bookings to like how you can build a better digital brand, like, you know, online, how you can monetize yourself online. Um, just like kind of all the questions that I get in my DMs from DJs, like creating them as like one, like one sheeters or like five page PDFs and like really taking the time to develop something really cohesive and, and invaluable. And then like right. starting, starting to monetize those for like maybe like five bucks a piece, you know, like something that could really be helpful for DJs, but could also support me and my endeavors, you know? Um, nice. That's kind of what I'm, what I'm working on right now. And um, which gets me really excited to see what you're cooking up. Cause I know you've had some really great um, resources and guides in the past before. So um, yeah, it kind of sounds like we're doing similar things. Um, that's cool to see like people trying to add to the space in that way. And just mm -hmm. for people who are unfamiliar with gum road, it's basically like a, it's a way of like selling digital products. So if you mm -hmm. want to check it out, gumroad.com. Um, but yeah, w one like transition that I've had is like, I used to try to just do it for like, try to come up with a, a flow where like they sign up for my email, <clears throat> excuse me. And then I send them the re resources like to a link mm -hmm. or whatever. And just to try to get more followers or subscribers yeah which is cool but you know to monetize that you basically have to like have so many followers that then yeah. you can get some kind of brand deal or advertising where it's like i might not ever achieve <laughs> that many followers mm -hmm. but if you can like sell a digital product for like the cost of a beer you know like yeah. you know, buying me a beer or something that's how i kind of phrasing it then that's actually potentially like real revenue that you can have now and yeah. you can try to convert those people and then like you know, you'll get better signal where it's like, you can actually see, okay, is this product actually valuable? People will hit you up and be like, Hey, this is really helpful. Or like maybe some people won't think it's valuable. And then you can figure mm -hmm. out, okay, how can I improve this? So I think that's really cool. And I think that's a cool, um, like trend I'd like to see of like, yeah, DJ has something to teach. Like mm -hmm. it's okay to charge for certain products like that. And so it's cool. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's the main thing too, is making sure it's valuable. Like if people see value in it, then like, you push it regardless, no matter what, you know, cause you never know like who's willing to, to put money forth for that. And, and yeah, I think you're right. Like, I think, especially if you're able to like, if you, if you have a winning product that people are willing to drop money for, and you even spend like, say like 20% of your return on ads, then like you're just going to keep, you're going to keep generating leads, you know, cause then if you keep running ads and you keep giving Instagram money, they're going to keep, iterating the algorithm and keep like like for me like i had this post that i created um about like la like last month about like dj bookings and like you know how much djs can be getting paid so i ended up posting that on my feed and just off natural organic like um like you know just off like no ads yeah. it ended, up, ended up doing pretty well like i think i got like I don't know. It, was, it got a lot of traction and I knew that it was doing well because the, the shares were high and the saves were high, which that typically notifies you that it's, it's like something valuable to people. So I was like, you know what, let me, let me throw some, some money into this. And so I think I ended up throwing in like a hundred bucks over like a span of a week, something super simple. And like, now it's almost like a 2000 likes and like, and from there it got generated a bunch of leads. Like people started messaging me, like, they were asking me for one-on-one -on -one coaching, like stuff like that. I was like, oh, oh shit, <laughs> like, that's crazy. Like I literally only invested like a hundred bucks and through that I could right. easily get back on one. So like, that's what I'm trying to build now. Cause I see the potential there. Mm -hmm. And so I would say my biggest problem right now is yeah, the reason I'm, I'm, I never commit to one style of content is because a lot of my followers right now are like day-to-day -day people like you know, people that I have from high school, like people who met me at the club and like follow me for, for DJ content, but also there's all the DJs that come to me for kind of value and like want, want that kind of like DJ content. That's like very technical, but then I feel like I'm going to lose the average person who doesn't care about that kind of stuff. Like, did you want, did you want me to blend like a bad bunny song or something, you know? So that's kind of my dilemma right now and why I've been leading to maybe potentially starting like like an off offset brand of Bay wave, which is like just specifically for, for my, like my, like, I don't even know what to call it. Just like my, like expertise knowledge or just like DJ, right. like coaching or stuff like that. Just cause I feel like I don't want to start bombarding my feed with a bunch of like, um, like technical language and then losing potential yeah folks that want to come out to my event so that's that's kind of been my my hard line right now which is what i've been struggling with 
Yeah, I feel you on that. It's kind of like understanding what your channel mix is and like understanding which types of content can go into which channel. My problem yeah. is that I'm super lazy and like the idea of having to do multiple channels just <laughs> really scares and scares me. Yeah. Um, but I totally feel you. I feel like on Twitter, I'm trying to do a certain thing because I also have interests outside of DJing. And so yeah, I'm like, do I just do everything on every platform or do I try to just do certain things? Maybe like my tech writing on Twitter and then kind of like my business of DJing content on Instagram. But yeah, the uh, the saves and the shares are always my favorite metric, especially the saves mm. for like yeah. my taxes of DJing stuff because it just yeah, shows yeah. that people actually found value in it. Yeah, no, I mean, that that specifically is huge already. Like, it's like, it literally applies to almost any living DJ on the planet. So, like, right. you, like your product really has potential. And I feel like, like if you just keep pushing pushing the ads on it, I'm sure you're going to keep generating leads. So let's uh, spend some time here a little bit more. So I noticed that you have different types of content where you do, like, kind mm -hmm. of, like, the GIFs or, like, the almost, like, real TikTok-style video. Do you use – what platforms do you use? And then how do you – Cause I'm like really bad at the real type content mm -hmm. of like creating it and being consistent with it. So yeah. yeah. The question there, what, what platforms do you use? And then how do you go about creating the content on each one? Yeah. So up until now, I've been pretty much experimenting with just different, like real, like type content, like um, bingeable content. Like if you go through my reels, none of it is consistent. Like each video has been like a different type of video. And so I guess from start to beginning, what I do is I, I'm always saving content that I watch on TikTok and I watch on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I'm always just saving as many videos as I can that inspire me and that I want to kind of replicate in the future. So then from there, I got to go back and I look at what video do I want to kind of mimic? Like, I don't want to copy verbatim, but what kind of video inspires me that I feel like would be a good fit for my own page. So I kind of go through there. I find a post and then I, then I take it and I'm like, okay, how can I replicate this video in my own style? Like right. maybe it's like a, it could be like a knitting, like a knitting video, but I just like the way the girl had her angle, her camera. Like I like the text that she used, like the, the premise of it. Like just, I know that it has a good hook. So I pretty much just reenact the video in my own way. Um, in terms of like recording, I record everything in app, like with my phone. Um, I do have a DSLR that I want to start using more, but for now, like, I kind of just like the practicality of having the iPhone and just like wanting to show folks that you can create good content with just an iPhone. Right. Um, so I have my specific settings that I use on my iPhone. Like I, like I always shoot at 24 frames per second. That's just like my go-to, like, which I know a lot of people who don't even know you can switch your phone to 24 frames. So that right off the bat makes people look at my content very differently. Cause they're like, yo, like I've never seen an iPhone shoot like that. And it's like, cause people don't have the, don't, a lot of people don't even care about touching the settings, you know, on the camera app. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah so 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 once i once i record um on cinematic cinematic is probably the key thing too that cinematic mode on the iphone 14 just really you know increases the quality dramatically um and then using 24 frames just makes the video look cinematic right off the bat um but in terms of editing i currently use CapCut. Um, i use CapCut both on my phone and on my laptop but i do prefer the laptop version more because you can download LUTs from um, from other creators. So I've kind of been doing that because, you know, right now when you edit a, a video on your phone, you can add a filter, but the filter will also apply like over your face. So your face might look super orange, but the background looks like great. So right. with CapCut on desktop, you can download a LUT. So you can make like the background turn orange, but your face stays completely fine. So there's like an option that's okay. like, um, it's like, uh, like something just like face recognition essentially so okay. that's been really helpful because it allows you to like your video just step up the quality much like it makes it look more professionally you know made um, and then CapCut honestly like I know it started off as like a joke app like I used to always use Final Cut Pro or like uh, or like Adobe Premiere but CapCut has just like they're really taking it to the next level and they're really like creating a bunch of really dope templates right now even like TikTok will push your video even more if you use CapCut. So if you export a video within CapCut, you can choose a post to TikTok. And I've been seeing a lot of creators saying that if you use that method, if you use one of CapCut's built-in templates, like right. your video will automatically go viral just because they're, 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 they want people to use, like I think TikTok bought, bought CapCut or something like that. So. Interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. I'll link to that in the show notes. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, it's one thing I've been thinking about of like as I create these DJ products, like what do I want like the face of it to be on like a reel mm-hmm. so you can um, go forward? Because right now I just do like a taxes for DJs like words, yeah. but I feel like there could be more dynamic things. So as you're thinking about your products, I'm sure that you'll come uh, come across that and experiment. So excited to see um, how that goes for you. Yeah, man. I mean, right now I, I would say like just to summarize out of all my research that I've done. I realize it's just key to just have one good series for each of the things you want to do. So I'm, I'm going to have one good educational series, which that's going to be like me kind of more like spitting education, you know, for, for DJs and having that be consistent. Um, and then I'm going to have one good entertainment series. So one that's like consumable content for like people that are into music. And then it's going to have one motivational one. So those are my three series and I'm looking to build and just making those as similar as possible so that every time I post one, people recognize the style of video and they Got would it. want to follow me to come back. And so kind of like a part one, part two, part three series. Um, and so that's what I'm focusing on right now is developing the, the concept for each of those three and then just completely writing with those to the end of the, to the end of the journey. Cause I've been noticing a lot of DJs that have been growing like exponentially on social media recently have because they stuck with one theme and right. they're kind of known for that theme, but that doesn't mean you have to do it forever, but at least just until you grow to a point where you're comfortable, you know? Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Definitely helps sometimes to find a niche and kind of like exploit that niche and, and yeah. grow into it. Um, cool, man. Well, before we go into the last part, uh, we're talking about like music taste and library organization just want to give an opportunity to talk about like what's next for you what, do you, what would you say like are your biggest goals this year and uh, what are you looking to accomplish and anything i know you got some stuff queued up i don't know if you can talk about it yet but mm. just want to open the floor to talk about what's next yeah man um right now my two biggest focus um focuses are number one is just monetization on social media um I really, really want to build and show others that it's possible to build like a really sustainable income through like through being a, a DJ, like um, and just showing people that there's like, you know, being a DJ has been the definition of it has been changing so much that I kind of want to I kind of want to become the face of like this new like this new generation of DJs and like what it's like to be a DJ and like how to monetize yourself online and everything from YouTube to TikTok to Pinterest, like just like showing people the multiple routes that you can do this as a DJ. Cause you know, you see people doing it as like affiliate marketers or like, or like drop shippers, but like, I think no one's really showing the, the, the possibilities as a DJ. And so that's kind of my goal is like, you know, just um, using my knowledge to kind of push that. So that's, I think that's my main focus for this year. And then um, at the same time is like, using using what other people are creating to kind of push forward like i'd want to like you know through this like push what you're working on you know with your business of djing because i feel like it's something so key that like even if i don't have the time to explain that i can just you know offset everyone to you to learn from you and what you're doing and same with other djs that are building other things like djs who are creating their own like courses for like you know, technical skills. Like I know I'm not the most technical DJ, so I'm not going to try to sit there and explain DJs like how to scratch when I have a friend who could do that, you know, like same thing with you. Like I may not understand the taxing, the taxes side of DJing so well, so I can offset that to you and just kind of being a resource for people to kind of like when they need information. Um, and then the second thing is just bookings. Like I really want to ramp up um, my booking strategy this, this year before you know, I was pretty like blessed that I was always getting a lot of opportunities, like people always contacting me. And so um, I was able to build kind of like a good sheet, like a venue sheet from that, that I can kind of reach out to when I'm looking for, for new venues. But this time I want to start traveling a little more like outside of California. And so now that I have this, this, um, my project manager is helping me to reach out. We're like drafting up email templates and like trying to really reach out to venues in other states and see if I can start like traveling a little more, more consistently. So um, I think those are my two main goals is just um, becoming a bigger figure online for DJs and then growing my mark outside of the Bay area, I would say are my two main pieces that I'm really focusing on right now. Nice, man. That's dope. Mm -hmm. I actually have an idea around 
I don't know if it's like call it like gig surfing, but it's like kind of like trying to create a community mm-hmm. of DJs where, you know, we talk about stuff like business and DJing, um, mm-hmm. but also like kind of have different like area or location or city representatives. And mm-hmm. then if you're trying to travel somewhere new and like maybe you have a gig somewhere, you know, in Berkeley or something, you could be like, hey, you know, someone's traveling this area. I got you on a gig if you if you're coming through yeah. some of your SoundCloud or whatever, just like, you know make sure the person's cool or whatever and yeah. if you're going somewhere else you could hit up the, the place for that city as well and be like hey man i'm coming out to this city anybody got any things i could hop on for so maybe i'll hit you up after that we'll talk through that but i would love to try to create a system where djs could like help each other out and be able mm-hmm. to travel um in situations where they wouldn't otherwise yeah. be normally able to yeah no definitely i think that's i mean that's a super smart strategy like that's kind of like the origins of scam artists like when scam artists was first coming up it's like just connecting djs big djs from each city that had a lot of opportunities and then just swapping them you know so like you know now that you're in new york like you're building your network out there you know like and then you meet some venues so that when you want to come to the bay i can lock you in here in the bay you lock you know folks out in new york and and, you know it's it's definitely a great concept i think it's just now like being strategic with like who you're reaching out to and like, and all that. So, yeah. I'd love, I'd love to talk about that for sure. All right. Dope, man. Well, appreciate your time. Let's close it out here with little, just like yeah. DJ talk. Um, so I want to talk about music taste first. So how would you describe your DJ style? And then <laughs> secondly, what do you listen to when, when you're not DJing or when no, when no one else is listening? Yeah. Um, so I would say my DJ style is very, I mean, in, in basic terms, open format, um, pretty much I started off with hip hop. And then as I got into college, I got really exposed to like the pop stuff that everyone wants to listen to. But then my roots are I'm Latino. So I, I understand Latin music really well. Right. So overall, I feel like any room that you put me in, like I can I can pretty much read the crowd and, and drive them through whatever journey they need to be taken on. So, yeah, that would say just super open format. Um, and then. In terms of what I listen to on my own time, I, I'm a sucker for Drake. I'm a big Drake fan. I think people know that I'm a big Drake fan. And so um, right now, like my Spotify is just Drake and Bad Bunny. <laughs> it's, it's pretty, pretty basic, to be honest. It's, I'm, my music, my music style is the most, like, even if I'm on a, if I want to listen to something random, like that's not Drake and Bad Bunny, I'll just play the um, top 40 hits, like Spotify top 40. Just because I feel like I want to know what what people are listening to and just always right, being up right. to music and I do like I have some DJ friends who are super into like indie stuff or like but yeah I've just never gotten into that I'm, I'm I've been I'm the epitome of like mainstream radio <laughs> guy like <laughs> it's all good man you know what you like yeah um cool and then lastly I like to I love talking about this uh this mm. topic of like library organization I feel like I'm on this earth to create a product that just makes the dj ecosystem as efficient as possible <laughs> yeah uh because it just sometimes it just bothers me what we have to go through to like get a song from like listening to playing yeah. but just generally how, how do you organize what, what's like your process from like listening to playing in serato i'm guessing you serato yeah so um right now i have you know my my go-to record pools that i just for me, I my most recent approach has been to only download music that people like my goal is like if I walk into any nightclub, 90% of the people in the room have to know what I'm playing. Like even if it's a remix, like it has to be a decently like not too changed up remix because people a lot of times people don't really enjoy remixes as much as us DJs want them to. Right. So my goal is again just go on Spotify, go through the top 40 see what people are listening to and then finding my favorite remix of that song online or like my best like edit version of it and that's helped me a lot with like cluttering my serato because i used to just download packs and packs of music just like you know you never know when you'll need it but it's like i realized i was always playing the same music so right <laughs> i keep it very safe like if say drake drops a new song mm-hmm. tomorrow I'll go probably in the next week and find and go through my different record pools and find my favorite version of that song, like my favorite edit, like maybe it's like a slam edit or some kind of slight little redrum or something like, and then I'll just keep that version forever and I'll play that version forever until like I maybe find a better one. 
But yeah, I, I really started reducing the amount of music that I download. And then the way that I organize it is um, I download everything into genres when I down. So I have the option in Safari, like it's, it asks you every time what folder you want to put the song in. Mm -hmm. So anytime I download a new song, I select the folder, the genre that I want it to go in. Okay. And then it just downloads straight into that genre. So then it always scares everyone when I do this. But when I open Serato, all my crates are just like my genres that are like dragged from my desktop. So I just delete all of them. I delete all my crates and then I redrag um, like the, the new songs that I've downloaded, like the new crates and pretty much my music is organized by genre. And then how I visualize like my club sets is I have a folder for my smart crates. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, so I love using smart crates because I feel like it's, it does all the work for you. So then what I do is I go through all my newest hip hop tracks and then I have certain keywords that then filters into the smart crates. So like if it's a new like Coily Ray song or like High Spice, I'll tag it as hip hop. In the comment section, I'll tag it as like club, like nightclub. Comments and in the in the Serato. In the Serato, yeah, in okay. the Serato panels, I'll I have the I use the label column as like my like what late I when I'm labeling it like yeah. So I'll put like nightclub, and then I'll put like twerk or like or like ratchet or like bay area or just like certain keywords right and then from there i have a smart crate that reads for me so it'll just automatically pull that song that i just downloaded into that smart crate do you have to do so it one by one though or can you one by one yeah see this yeah. is my biggest problem is like i wish you could like highlight multiple songs and then like add a tag but instead of it like overwriting all your previous tags you could just like add the tag to whatever was already listed before like, oh, you have yeah. like multiple songs and like this one has one tag this one has two you highlight both and then add a new tag it's gonna like overwrite both yeah tags. no so I, I definitely like, think that serato needs to have way more like i think especially for djs i like doing a lot or like like to really customize their things i think they yeah. they need some work to do like i i it, it pisses me off that you can't select multiple crates on the left like you can't just drag like three of them. Oh yeah. Drag. Like like that should be such a basic thing you should be able to do. But so like you if you're can't. doing like a new venue and then you have to like add a bunch or like new gig and let's say you want to have like edits hip hop house. Yeah. Like blah 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 and then like. What yeah, my, you have to do, strategy, you have to be one by one, one by one. The, the new strategy <laughs> is to like drag like crate four into mm -hmm. crate one, three into one, two into one, and then mm -hmm. you can just drag this. Cr create one to where you actually want it to be oh, like i yeah. use like a year folder yeah. and then from there you can like you know put it back to the org yeah yeah that's structure. smart but it's like yeah. it's not a perfect tag <laughs> yeah that's anyway. smart. yeah i mean there's i mean i think every dj has their own their own method and yeah like i don't think i've ever spoken to two djs that had the same organization method like everyone just has their own way of doing right. it and if it works for you it works for you like sometimes i'll, I'll be looking at djs who they're their, their library looks so messy. I'm mean, like, how do you even like, but, or it's like funny, like my, my friend Frisco Eddie, his library to me looks crazy. Like it just looks absolutely hectic, but he's one of the most organized people that I know. Like you can just, you, you ask him for a song and he'll find it right off the bat or like, he'll know like what folders to use and what venues, like, whereas to me, it looks like a, like, it looks like a shit show. Like, like for me, I'm a big, uh, I hate having songs that have like all caps or like a bunch of underscores or like yeah, random, yeah. like, so I always rename all my music. So if you look at my, my Serato, everything's pretty much renamed. So it looks the same. Whereas like his will have like all caps, like letters and like colors. And I was like, I don't know how you can do that. <laughs> it's distracting for me. Yeah. Our buddy, uh, plural, uh, Joe, it's like a running joke on the team that his library is always, just, it's crazy to go in there, but. <laughs> it works for him and he's like the, the dopest gg i know so yeah. <laughs> whatever he's doing is working yeah exactly um dope man well once again bay wave thank you for coming on the business of djing this was an awesome conversation um we'll put all your social stuff in the notes for people to follow you mm -hmm. really excited to see what you've been able to build and i really loved our like part of the, con part of the conversation talking about content and it seems like we're kind of doing similar things in terms of like trying to build tools for djs yeah, to help grow so Looking forward to more synergy and more ways we can kind of 
help each other and um, point each other in, in each other's ways in the future. Yeah, likewise, bro. I'm excited to see what we can both cook together. All right, bro. Let me turn off the recording here. Yeah.